and welcome to the Codex Cantina, where I am Una. And I am not crypto. Today, we are joined by our lovely friend Leslie from The Nerdy Narrative. If you aren't already subscribed to her, please go check out her channel. But we're going to do a fireside chat today. The idea is just have a fun, casual conversation between two friends about a book that they really, really enjoyed. The Only Good Indians. I love this book. I love this book so much. So when this title first came out, I think it got a lot of pushback, right? People didn't know necessarily mm -hmm. the name Stephen Graham Jones if you didn't already follow him or read one of his previous 25 books. And they're like, wow, that sounds really racist, right? A lot of people took offense to it and even went so far as to give him a one-star review because they were offended he put the word Indian in a title. Just do a little bit of research and you'll see that Stephen Graham Jones is a Blackfeet writer. So Stephen Graham Jones was actually born and raised in West Texas and later moved and now still resides in Colorado. So he has a very prestigious title of the Ivina Riley Baldwin Endow Chair of English at the university where he still is teaching. This guy is amazing. By the age of 50, or not even quite the age of 50, he already had 22 novels that he had published. Very prolific. Yeah, I was actually reading that when he got his like PhD, I think it was in creative mm -hmm. writing, like the dissertation, he gave it. And I guess the, the one of the people who were, were reading it, you know, you have to go through a chair. You have, there's a whole process to, you know, get your PhD. One of them wanted to, he, he, he didn't know it at the time, was a publisher. And he actually wanted to publish his paper that he was submitting at the time too. So it's just in his DNA that he's just been a writer his whole life. That is awesome. I did not read that. Well, he is a writer that I think is celebrated in a lot of different ways. And I think that's what can pull the audience, right? I think mm -hmm. you have a much deeper background in horror genre. And you might be looking for certain things in that horror genre when you're reading this book. I think I tend to have a little bit more of a focus today's age, at least in literary fiction. So I'm looking for more of the literary aspects in this story. And maybe maybe some of these multi-genre challenges have caused some people to maybe have conflicts over what does this book mean to us and what, is, what does it mean for enjoyment, I guess? Yeah, and that's why I was so excited for you to read this with me because while he does write in several genres, and I knew this was a horror book, I also knew it was very much celebrated for its literary approach to it. And I thought, you know what? When you mentioned that you had an interest, I was like, I have to get you in on this because I wanted your take from the literary side of things and then combine that with my take from the horror side of things. Yeah, and it's worth noting that, that Leslie was kind enough to have purchased a book for us. We were trying to check it out from the library, and there's like a six-week wake at my library, right? So, so we got into this, right? And one of the things that actually drew me to it originally, I don't know if you remember what got you interested in this book, but it was actually a oh, rant. It, was, it wasn't even it wasn't really? a rant. It wasn't a rant on the book, but on the community around it, because they were talking oh. about how this is a book written for more, you know, neither Native American or indigenous background people. It's not meant to explain mm -hmm. it to people who aren't familiar with the culture. And that's, that's what I love just diving and immersing myself into that. And I'm okay being uncomfortable. And I'm okay, learning about these other cultures. And that's what drew me to this. That's hilarious. Because what drew me to it is I knew that there was a big basketball influence over the story. And I know that you and I both love basketball. And I was like, oh, this is something we can share with a sport that we both love. Right, right. And I think a lot of people maybe don't know that basketball has a huge tie in culturally with a lot of, of native, native and indigenous peoples. I'll, I'll leave mm -hmm. a link down below if you aren't familiar it goes back to the time of when, you know, Americans were settling and we had some schools put up to help indoctrinate or help educate them on the European way, depending on what narrative you want to put onto it. And they kind of lost a lot of their cultural heritage learning the European way. And basketball became this symbol and way to kind of, I guess, hold on to things. I'll read the article to really dive into it and, and, and you know get it explained to you better than I could. But just keep in mind that there are going to be some cultural things here that, that if you look and are open to exploring more, that as they're writing these scenes, I think you're going to, I'm going to pull out a couple of literary elements that I think help explain maybe how it could resonate with people differently. 
So I am very much into physical books. I know you love the audiobooks and you love your ebook, but for me, there's nothing better than a good physical book in my hands. And one of the things that I found very attractive about The Only Good Indians is this simplistic cover. I love how mm. simple it is, but it gets the point across. Now, you may not understand what it is when you're just picking it up and you haven't read it. It just has a picture of a, of a big buck on the front with a huge rack of antlers. So you kind of get the idea that there's maybe something involving hunting. But once I started reading this book and getting to the crux of it, it actually scared me. So it just, it's very simple, but it's very scary. And I actually, after I started reading it and got past about the, I would say about the 35, 40% mark, I started mm -hmm. putting it down, face down, after I get done reading it, because I didn't want to look at the front of it anymore. Okay. <laughs> Did you take a look at the cover? I love the cover. I think it's gorgeous. And, you know, for me who, because when you pull out the audiobook, it shows the cover when you're listening to yeah. the audiobook. And what's really cool, too, just a minor note, is that they actually got a Blackfeet native to do the narration for the audiobook, too. So it's kind of creating two jobs, which I appreciate from, like, a, a jobs perspective. You know, I, okay, so you talk about, when we talk about what defines this book, okay, you've started to talk about how that 35, you know, 40% mark, you and I have read it, we know what happens at that part, and, mm -hmm. and it kicks it into high gear. If, if I could just defend that first 30, 35%, 40%, not that you were putting it down, <laughs> but for I've seen other reviews out there, that was actually my favorite part of the book. Really? When, well, when they say, they say when you're going through trauma as a writer to mm -hmm. slow down, take your time. Sadness is something that needs to be pulled out from a reader. And I think that combines well with the horror side of things, right? In terms of starting out slow, hearing the noise in the bushes, setting up the danger, but not seeing or recognizing exactly, identifying the danger. That first part of that book with the trauma that they're talking about in terms of, you know, even when like the police come to the Lewis's house, you'll notice how they kind of dismiss him and they start to mm -hmm. interrogate him. And I think that kind of speaks to, I think, a little bit of the, the racial injustice that happens with in America. And I think there's even those conversations with PETA, who is not Blackfeet and was white. And I think that is something that will resonate with people. And I think that was probably some of the most engaging material in this book. And I get so sad when people are like, they want to skip over that. And it's like, isn't this interesting to see how people have different experiences? Like the books can bring that out for us. Yeah, I think what I had a problem with was the sentence structure, and it is not the book's fault. It was 100% my fault. I did not obey grammar rules, which was the comma usage. I didn't pause. I wasn't pausing and just sucking it in like I should. Once I realized that that was my problem and I started obeying those commas and pausing, it definitely changed for me. I very much enjoyed that first 35, 40%. There was so much, actually all of the humor was in that section. And it was just the kind of humor that really resonated with me, had me laughing and smiling. And it also, I started out honestly on the side of Lewis, but I didn't end up on his side. Mm. You know, that's a good point too. Not many people talk about the humor, right? Because there's there's humor and irony in the names. Lewis A. Clark is his full name, <laughs> reference to Lewis and Clark, right? His wife's yeah. name, the woman that doesn't eat meat and is a veterinarian, her name's PETA. I mean, come on. And yep. it's even spelled P-E-T-A. That's hilarious. It is. Yeah, I just, you have to appreciate when someone is just clever enough to poke a little fun here and there, that sort of thing. And I appreciated it. So speaking of poking around a little bit, you have a heavier interest in fantasy than, than our yep. focus, right? You feel like you, yeah, might have, uh, you might have been tapping a little bit on I the mean, fantasy? I felt a little, a little bit personally attacked. But again, <laughs> I also just found it hysterical. And that's one of my favorite parts is all of the little tiny jabs at the fantasy and... <laughs> The, uh, the stories that are out there and the authors who write them. I mean, if I, if I were a fantasy author, I would get a kick out of it. 
you know, and he does those small little things where if you read fantasy, you know what he's talking about. But if you don't, you're yeah. like, okay, that's probably a reference to something, but I don't know what. Example, yeah. they talked about like the single chink in the armor being like the weak spot, uh, a reference yep. to the Hobbit. And obviously, you know, Tolkien was kind of brought up a couple of times. And there's even some reader specific things when he's talking about mm-hmm. rifling through the books and how when someone dog ears a book, how it just like is like a, an arrow She's a monster. Heart. Yeah, it's like, yeah. how could you deface this beautiful book? The nerve. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so I'm, you know, I'm going to poke a little fun at you fantasy lovers out there, but then I'm going to make it better because we know readers, for the most part, don't like to dog ear books. And you don't write in a book that, I mean, well, you don't write in a book and you certainly don't write in someone else's book. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, that was the true horror of the book right there. <laughs> <laughs> or let me let me go back to something you said earlier about the narration because I did put a lot of thought into this because you know we read this with a group Brad Proctor and some other mm-hmm. individuals out there and someone stopped because of the you know the breaking of traditional you know if you were to follow 100% this is what you learned in school Stephen Graham Jones doesn't follow that but you know I mean he he's got a PhD in creative writing he's an English professor he's he did it on to, purpose do, he's doing this on purpose and I've thought about this because you talked about the way he talks, okay? Mm-hmm. And what I notice is that he made the narrator, the guy that's relaying, or girl, that's relaying the story to us, very casual, right? And usually narrators are meant to be like super smart. They're very by the rules in traditional literature. Here comes Stephen Graham Jones's style, which may just be his own you know, voice and that he just chooses not to change it. But either way, it results in a very interesting casual narrator that's just kind of sitting down to talk to you. But what's interesting, I think, about Stephen Graham Jones's writing is it's almost very journalistic and straight to the point. He doesn't beat around the bush a lot, and he just hits you with a fact sometimes, without the setup, without the closure, just boom, drops it on your lap. And that kind of, you'll notice that a lot of times he'll end sentences with, yeah, or you know. And I don't know if that's mm-hmm. a cultural thing, like, you know, in Canada, how the end sentences with, with A, in certain parts of Canada, I should say. But I don't know if that's cultural or not. But for, I have noticed that people that just, like, plop things out of the blue, they almost need to give you permission to think or take the next step in a conversation. And that's what Stephen Graham Jones does just as a person. He drops this information. And I think most people are just kind of stunned because he's so quick and to the point. So he'll just end the sentence with, you know, and that gives you permission to be like, oh, okay, it's my turn to respond. And he'll do that throughout this book. And I think it's just very interesting the way it kind of combines this casual conversation approach, but being very quick and to the point to, to what he's trying to deliver. You know what I find interesting about what you just said? Hmm. You do the same thing. Mm. you'll drop you'll drop knowledge in one of your videos and you'll end the sentence with right and so that that feels to me like you're inviting me to pause the video think about what you just said and see what i think and sometimes i even have to edit that right out after i end five sentences in a row with right i'm like yeah that's getting kind of (laughs) irritating i should probably stop doing that (laughs) (laughs) i like it i mean that's that's like a good, especially when it's a story that I have read or am reading with you, that gives me a moment to stop, pause, and it's like, okay, stop and think about this. Mm-hmm. Does that fit mm-hmm. in with what I inferred from the story, or do I agree, disagree, why? So that it allows me to feel like I'm actually engaging with you instead of just watching a video that you've uploaded. Right. And I think that's what's really nice about Stephen Graham Jones's writing is it's very inviting. And I think it being so casual may put some people off, but I think it's something that is, you know, there's, it's okay to write different ways. And I, and I like the way that he pulled this off. It's, it's storytelling. And I think that is something that is very important in his culture as a Blackfeet Native American. And it just, it just felt right. It just felt It just fit in with the whole story. And there was so much of his culture that was just slid and just added in right into the story. And it just had such a natural feel. And it had me so curious that I stopped. Well, I didn't stop. But after I finished the book, I went and read up all sorts of information about his culture and where he came from and all about his people. I wanted to know more about their tradition, their culture, their beliefs. 
and it was so amazing how much of it was incorporated into this story and I didn't take note of it at the time and after the fact it made me want to go back and immediately reread the book with just all of that that new face of knowledge sitting in there so I loved it and I think depending on the author right some of them want to give it to you some of them want to invite you to open that door right I, I, I think that's probably what you just said is a great compliment because I felt the same way of wanting to learn more about this uh, as I go through it. The structure, the way, you know, the way that you talked about him telling a story, like telling, you know, this is just part of a conversation. It's interesting the way he invites the reader in with kind of setting up the, the first half of it, in a sense, where you have mm -hmm. a, a terrible traumatic event in the beginning with the hunting of the elks, right? And he kind of slowly starts to reveal that information. But what's interesting is, is you have these four core people that after the event, it just, they explode, right? One goes one way, Lewis goes this way, and the other two still stay on the res, right? Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that I took away from a storytelling perspective is we got these different narratives of how these individuals processed their their decision, their mistake, the way that Lewis left the res versus the two individuals still on the res, how they looked at what they did 10 years ago to that elk and what they discovered and how culturally, you know, you're not supposed to throw away any part of the animal once it's killed. And, you know, they had to dump all of the meat and just kind of like just this, the very cultural traumatic horror of it too. What did you think were some of the inspirations or kind of influences that may have led him to kind of write this type of a story? So that's difficult because I can't remember what I thought before I read up on about, you know, on his process for writing this book. Mm. So all I have is in the front of my mind is the process he went through and how it originally started and how it came to be what it is today. <laughs> so okay. well, I, what is I think I just took it at face value. So this originally was going to be a novella and it was just going to be from Lewis's perspective. So the first section and when he wrote the last sentence, it was, I'll take it from here, dad, I've got this. And he realized, oh, oh I accidentally changed the point of view. Well, when he wrote that, he thought, you know what? I actually like that. So he took that part off and then he did the the, he did sections two and three with the point of view shift. And then also it didn't originally begin with Ricky's death. He decided that starting off with Lewis was a bit boring. So he decided to move Ricky's death from like the middle of the book to the first part of it. He said, you know, we need to get some blood in here. Mm -hmm. And I think that just really enriched the story. I, I think having, I also think it had a deeper meaning and showing these four guys were hunting somewhere they shouldn't have been. They killed a whole bunch of elk, which was more, you know, their belief and custom was to respect the animal, kill only what you need to eat. Mm -hmm. They didn't do mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. I feel like he really wanted to get the point across of, you're going to have consequences for your action. It may not be right away, it may be 10 years from now. And I think he wanted to just showcase how that could possibly happen in these four men's lives. And just also the fact that before the consequences came, they had to deal with their own guilt over what happened. And they did yeah. it in so many different ways. And I love that. I love you, that. You know, what kind of caught me by surprise in a good way is so, so we have a spirit of vengeance right? Which, which I don't know enough about, but we get the feeling from a horror perspective that there's something that's haunting them from a decision of their past. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. it jumped generations from the four individuals to their offspring, the Denora, who started mm -hmm. to have the basketball match at the end, that was something that kind of caught me by surprise. Well, I think the reason why that was, is the vengeful spirit was the, the elk, the mother who was pregnant when she was murdered, basically, by Lewis. Mm -hmm. And he not only took her life, he took the life of her baby. She was pregnant. 
And Mm -hmm. I mean, she, it was so hard to kill her. She was trying with everything she had to protect her child. And he killed her and her child. So in her mind, he deserved to die and any offspring he had. And I think Mm -hmm. that is how it all got started is because Lewis and Peta were pregnant. Well, and you hear about the cycle of hate, right? When one Mm -hmm. generation receives some trauma, they deliver back that trauma to the next generation. And it becomes this cycle of violence and destruction that, you know, in this story, at least, you know, Denora is given a chance to end that, right? It's, it's, It's on her responsibility to say, we, you know, we've made a mistake. How do we move past that? And it comes to what is a super, I, I freaking loved it, but that basketball mm-hmm. match at the end to uh, represent that. I it was so hard waiting on you to get to that part. I was literally <laughs> dying for you to get to that part. Dude. Tell me so, about so, it. I know you're not a visual reader, but I pictured I things. I mean, I could... I could see it. I could see every move. He did such a great job explaining how the moves work. I could hear their grunts. I could see their freaking sweat flying off of them. What, I mean, from your perspective, how much did you enjoy that? Like, I just. Th- that was, uh, that was amazing. And I'll say this. If he's not a super basketball fan, he tricked me completely. Oh, he is. And he played. Okay. He played. Cause... He grew up playing on his reservation. Yeah. So. so To me, this just felt so authentic. So I live in Indiana, for anyone that's new or doesn't know that. And, of course, we all know Reggie Miller, right? And he had this this trick. I don't think... So so when you're you're jumping, the way officials kind of call things is you have to give them landing space, right? So if you're knocking out their feet or if you're both jumping, you know, from a shooter and you're landing in their space that they fall down, in terms of safety, they're always going to call the foul. Right. That's that's kind of how officials document things. So Reggie Miller was so well known for this this silly little kick (laughs) when he's taking his three. He would kick his foot out in front of him so that he would make contact with the defender and then he'd fall down and he'd get the foul. And I think they changed some rules. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'd have to go research that. But they had the quote in here where they say, coach, let you Reggie Miller your leg out like that. I lost it because that's something only like if you're really into basketball, you understand. Cause it's not even like, it, I mean, it, it, it's a previous generation that was super into that. Right. And another thing that yeah. kind of helped me visualize, and maybe I was able to visualize it because I do play basketball. I love basketball. And I know you and I were, you know, sending messages back and forth during the finals last year is when he talked about like the turnaround, when you're taking the shot and sticking the elbow out, they talked about yes. you know, taking, sticking the elbow out to pop, you know, when you're when you're turning with the ball, if you pop the other person in the face with that elbow, right? That's mm-hmm. legal to do in a game, but you don't do that in street ball, right? In right. street ball, you you will keep the elbow in because like you understand this isn't I mean, <laughs> we're all amateurs. Well, yeah, we're there's no referee, yeah. yeah. So when they talked about that elbow move during the game, I was just like, Stephen Graham Jones, you are amazing. It was you a know, masterpiece. Well, it it captures the spirit of basketball and you and I don't have the cultural association with basketball the way some native or indigenous individuals would. So Mm -hmm. for me to get so excited about that book and then also want to learn and think about it from like a different perspective, because you had quotes when they're playing, this win isn't just for pride. It's for her tribe, her people. It's for every Blackfeet before and after. Like, you have to realize that this game is a metaphor. This game is a symbol for trying to accomplish something. You know, if you look at the previous generation in terms of the the butchers of Duck Lake, I think they called them, here comes Mm -hmm. this trauma towards her. She's playing a basketball game against the spirit of vengeance to end that cycle of violence. And it was beautiful if you're just open to kind of looking at it from that angle. And her realization through the game as she came to understand what was really at stake. Oh my gosh. I I mean, I just have chills thinking about it again. I absolutely just appreciated what was done there. And what was really funny is reading about the author afterwards. I believe I read somewhere he said, you know, he had been trying to write basketball in a book for 20 years. (laughs) Mm. So he was finally able to 
accomplish that with this one. Yes. And I'm, I want him to do another book on it because it was so amazing and I loved it. I wish he would. So one thing that you mentioned earlier was kind of what inspired this is the birth from novella to full novel was that point of view shift. I think it's worth mm-hmm. pointing out too, that we got a very minor, but small touch of the elk, you know, the spirit of vengeance, if you will's perspective kind of in like that final moments. What, what did you think about that? I loved it. The reason why I loved it is most of the time in horror, you don't get the perspective of the bad guy or the murderous villain. You Mm -hmm. only know what's happening from the victim's standpoint. I think it was just a great, just a personal touch to have that point of view from the vengeful spirit, just to allow the reader to relate. I mean, my opinion of what was right and wrong and who I was siding with change so many times throughout this book and that's just not normal i normally will relate to a character and that character is my ride or die throughout the entire story here i started out i was on the side of lewis i'm like yeah i realized they they did something wrong but you know people make mistakes and then Mm -hmm. when we switched over and got her point of view i was like well now wait a minute i started seeing it from the vengeful spirits point of view Well, but then when she started going after the kids, I'm like, well, now hang on here. (laughs) And so I was just flip-flopping around and the ending of this book, I mean, I just did not see that coming. It was nothing what I expected. I don't think it's anything I've ever seen in horror, but oh my gosh, it was beautiful i just i mean it's a horror story with a happy ending Mm. that doesn't happen but Mm. what's hilarious is it is the trope change you know you started out this was a slasher and then Mm. you ended with a final girls trope but uh, i would i would love to have i want i want more in this series i want something to happen somebody pisses that spirit off again and her and denora have to duke it out again on the court (laughs) So what you're saying is more Stephen Graham Jones and you highly recommend this book. I cannot say that enough. I've been on NetGalley trying to get an arc of his next one coming out this year. I am going into his backlog. I'm getting everything. From my perspective, from the literary angle, I really enjoyed what he talked about culturally. This is my first Stephen Graham Jones experience and I greatly enjoyed it. I I went and signed up for NetGalley trying to get, you know, the next one. I would love for us to be able to have another talk on uh, his, what is it? Love is a Chainsaw? So uh, My Heart is a Chainsaw is the next one. And I don't even know what it is because that's the beauty of Stephen Graham Jones. He doesn't write in just one genre. He writes in, I believe, four different ones, uh, experimental, crime, horror, and I want to say science fiction is the fourth. So I don't know what we're going to get. I don't care. I just want more. Good, good. So definitely something I think people would be interested in. There's going to be a lot of noise. And I think maybe because of all those genres, because of how flexible he is from a writing perspective, that uh, it's kind of hard to know what you're walking into. So, you know, walk into it with an open mind is, is the best thing that I can say. I think he absolutely pulled this off, particularly looking at it and trying to understand more from outside of my normal range of cultural experience. Uh, definitely one that I think we would do well for people in that boat. Agreed. All right, guys, thank you so much for checking out the video today. Please go check out Leslie's channel again. If you haven't already, she's amazing, puts out great content, and uh, we're going to do some more collabs like this in the future. So we really appreciate your guys' support and ears as we talk about books that we truly love. So if you're down for conversations like that, make sure you hit that subscribe button. We post videos every Monday and Thursday with a bonus video on Tuesdays. Una out. See ya.